Hi folks, that's Rena Jadav here with the Healthier Podcast. And today we are talking all about IBS, Crohn's, colitis, and gut health. And with me is the most amazing, inspiring Dr. Pyle Vindari. Dr. Pyle, welcome. Thank you for having me, Rena. So tell everyone who doesn't know how amazing you are a little bit about your background and uh, where your focus is these days. Well, I'm a board certified family doctor who over eight years ago decided to shift into integrative functional medicine with a focus on gut function, the autoimmune disorders, and cancer. And the reason is, is because it is really looking at the level of an epidemic we have on these health issues. And I started to see around me that these chronic diseases are now just being treated as chronic diseases and we're not reversing them. And so as I started digging more and understanding how the cells function, I realized that when we go back to the beginning, the answers are there. We just sometimes don't know how to find them. And so my job is to know exactly how cells function and how they function in each individual person so that we can turn things around. And what my experience has been is that many of people's symptoms, when the root cause is addressed, they resolve within weeks to months and they really do dramatically start feeling better. So let's talk about root cause um, and specifically let's talk about Crohn's colitis, IBS. For those who are suffering and really haven't understood what the underlying um, pathology is for these diseases, could you share a little bit about why does the gut go from being a healthy gut to then developing something like an IBS or Crohn's or colitis? So if you think about how the gut works, it's got to get the right fuel in a certain way. So it's about literally going back to your high school biology where 90% of a cell is water and oxygen. And so for the gut, which is one of the largest organs in the body, and if you were to stretch it out, it is miles long. It's the art of how that system gets well lubricated in a sense. And it gets the signals from the nervous system to say, hey, it's safe for you to do your job. And so when things are in alignment and that system is well lubricated, when food comes in, in a way that the body senses it's safe, it's able to create an alkaline environment where that food is nicely digested, the nutrients are absorbed, and they go into the cells along with the oxygen being delivered, and so cells can do their job and create enough energy. What's happening though in today's world is we have in some ways, as much as we value food, we've also devalued the experience of how to eat. We've made the food we eat, we're disconnected by it. We've created a lot of confusion around it. And so what's happening is, is that even the way we hydrate, the way we eat, it's kind of created this like stress response. The whole system keeps saying, so you really like what you eat, you're looking at all these labels, but you don't even care about the eating process. So it keeps shutting down. Number two, it's also what we're consuming. It's, we don't really all eat real foods anymore, right? We now have exposure to foods that used to be luxuries, where we never really had access to them, or only certain communities did. And all of a sudden, everybody has access to everything. And so we believe, well, we should have the right to eat whatever we want, whenever we want. And the reality is that's not the way human beings work. And so when there's this whole mismatch of how to do the basics and we're not teaching that over generations, it's kind of gotten forgotten from the grandparents down to the parents and now to our children. And that's been going on for many generations. Those basic knowledge is getting lost. And then what happens is when your tummy hurts and when something, you know, you're constipated. So the system's not getting cleaned out in a way. The answers then that we're being given is not connected to why it's not working. So it creates more confusion in the sense of, well, I keep filling up my system. I keep drinking, I keep eating, and I don't really realize it's not cleaning out. So if the system doesn't get cleaned out, 
then, and that doesn't mean, oh, I have a bowel movement every day, because you have to realize that that colon, which is the small and the large intestines, it's like miles long if you stretch it. So you right. have to know how long does, when I eat this, how long is it going to take to go through? And different foods have different biochemistries. So the foods that pass through in 12 to 15 hours are very different than the foods that take three to seven days. But we as humans are meant to eat foods that pass through us in 24 hours. And if they sit there for days and days, they're like cooking in an oven and they're fermenting and they're rotting. And that's when you talk about the microbiome, that the bad bugs get overfed and the good bugs don't. And those bugs are there to take care of us. They are actually what activates vitamins and enzymes and they let the body work. So when we have now had this belief system in the last, you know, more than a century that like bugs are bad, no, we can't live without bugs, right? Because you have to remember that was derived from penicillin, who is it's considered the miracle drug of the 20th century. Well, penicillin is derived from mold, it's from moss. So when you start saying, well, we should kill all the bugs, uh, no, that doesn't make sense. And what's happening is, is that things are not clearing out of the system when they should clear out the system. Number two, the system often can feel more panicked and you don't even realize it. So then the system breaks down. And when it breaks down, what happens is, is that those cells are not getting nourished. They're not getting loved. So basically, when the cells, especially of the gut lining, that wall of the gut is only one cell thick. When it breaks down, you know, it was supposed to contain all the gunk so you could poop it out. And if you didn't poop it out, you're supposed to pee it out. But when that system keeps breaking down, then the stuff on the inside of the gut starts leaking out into the bloodstream. And what's going to happen? It's going to start going everywhere. And the body starts panicking. And it says, oh my God, there's all these toxins and there's all these antibodies. What are they doing out here? So then it starts attacking. And so you know it in a second. That's our gut instincts. When you start feeling, oh, I feel a little anxious. I feel like my heart's beating differently. I think I'm sweating. And now our emotion associates with, oh, it's this situation. But in reality, that's there to take care of you. But over time, when you ignore your instincts and you push it aside, you say, you know, I'll deal with it later. The dealing with it later never happens. And we start focusing on what's right in front of us. So the system keeps breaking down. So it's like leaking gunk out and that will settle into your joints, settles into your blood vessels. There's a whole system that was there to protect us so that when we felt something wasn't right, we were supposed to say, oh, I realized that's the problem. But now when we ignore that and we say, that's the symptom is the problem. You're like, right. no. So it's kind of like this vicious cycle. And so when somebody says, my tummy has been really hurting for a long time, and now I'm, it's really bothering my lifestyle, now they showed up and they started saying something about it, and people say, oh, well, this is just IBS, or this is like constipation. And then they treat it never associated with why it happened or what could you do. Then the system gets more complicated, and the longer it goes on, then we call it inflammatory bowel disease. And then after a while, we call it, you know, colon cancer and stomach cancer. Or if it's not presenting that way, we give it a different name. Like we say, oh, this is rheumatoid arthritis, or it's Hashimoto's, or we say MS. You know, we come up with all these thousands right. of diagnoses, but we're not going back to the beginning right. of I was feeling something funny and every time I felt it, I misinterpreted it, but the world was teaching me this. So we've got to like get back really basic and figure yes. out how to make you feel safe. How does the body trust you? And how do we get things in the way you want them to and make it work? And it's all going back to the roots. It's going back to the basics. And yeah. there isn't a magic pill, you know, I had, Severe gut issues, as uh, my history includes colon cancer at 35, and it includes um, a gut-driven complete meltdown two and a half years ago, which is how I'm even doing HealCircle.org. 
um, because no one should be that sick and the answers are out there and we can reverse these. So, so Dr. Pyle, I wanna ask you this because there's so much misinformation. Can Crohn's and colitis and IBD be reversed? Not managed, not symptom managed, but actually reversed. Have you seen this? Yes, and it's always reversed. I mean, you can, you know, it's like telling somebody at the age of 90, oh, well, whatever you have, that's it. And you're saying, no, at any point in time, you can reverse anything. It starts with, we're going to change that thought. And if we change that thought, we're going to change that action. So we're going to connect with you as a person, not as a disease. Yes. And if we connect with you, not through fear, but through compassion, that's where the game changes. Yes. Yes. And it really does begin with believing you can heal. I had been suffering for almost eight months before I met this insanely amazing integrative practitioner in Houston of all places who sat me down and said, you know, child, um, you're convinced you're not going to heal. And there's nothing I can do if you are convinced you are not going to heal. I really need you to believe me when I say I've seen people sicker than you and they have hundred percent been healed. And I said, I don't believe you because I've been let down by like 18 other doctors at this point. So my trust in um, the fact that I'll get better is, you know, pretty close to zero. And she said, okay, we're going to start really small. Um, what if I got rid of your hives? Cause I had 28 symptoms. And I said, get rid of my hives. Really? You can do that? She says, well, we'll, we'll start slow. How about I'll give you Antronex because the, the meds you're taking are going to make you demented and senile in like <laughs> 10 years. And, um, you know, you're too lovely to be demented. So I, I need you to get off those things you're taking. I was taking these anti-allergy pills like six in the morning and six in the afternoon. And she says, you're going to take Antronex, which is basically just crushed up liver. And if your hives go away, then you come back to me and you come back knowing that you are 100% reversible and you will absolutely be as healthy as, as you were before, if not healthier. And we got there. We, we got there. But to your point, Dr. Pyle, it really started with my belief in whether it was going to happen or not. So for those of you listening, you've heard this from an, from a trained MD. You know, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, I hear all these quacks saying you can reverse, but MDs never say that. Well, here's an MD who's telling you that yes, you can reverse Crohn's and colitis. You do not have to symptom manage for the rest of your life. Yes. Number two, you got to start with compassion and you got to start with the belief that you can heal. Now, beyond that, Dr. Pyle, what can you share in terms of, you know, when you're sick, it is so hard to know where to even start. I remember feeling overwhelmed, um, not knowing who to trust, not knowing who to believe, not knowing where to, where to start. For people who are struggling, what is the simplest place for them to start? They have to just realize they're alive that day and they have to, not they have to, but to find a place of gratitude. I mean, if you wake up that morning, that is a celebration that you're, you're alive and you can't take that for granted. And when you wake up and you actually recognize that you're breathing, you've taken the first step. And then if you go to the bathroom and you mindfully just drink a cup of hot water, connect with the experience because when you are fully immersed in it you're showing up you're just starting to turn off that constant panic signal because if you're constantly saying i don't want this i don't want to feel my stomach hurt i don't want this i don't want that well that's exactly what's going to happen so it is just show up in that moment just be fully there because what's going to happen you're gonna start turning on your real intelligence. That intelligence is not all in the brain. The real intelligence is this heart intelligence, which is, you know, this is actually well studied, that the heart is also an endocrine organ, and exactly where the heart is aligned near the stomach, 
there is specifically an intense number of nerve fibers there. Those fibers, they send a signal to your brain. And your brain, when you think you're using all your brain, you're only using maybe 3% of the prefrontal cortex. The rest of it is all automatic. So if it gets a sight signal of panic, then it just sends this signal of like, okay, I'm gonna change the way you're breathing, I'm gonna change the way you're thinking, I'm gonna change everything. So you're gonna go and just shut down. So then you say, okay, I'm gonna eat these right foods. But if you're not showing up when you actually cut the food up or you prepared it, or when you're going to eat it, it doesn't matter what you do, you aren't gonna, it's all stuck there in your chest. So the one thing I would say is, whatever it is, just be fully immersed in it. The reason is, is I need your whole body to be able to actually sense that it can trust you. Not be in your brain saying, okay, I've done all these steps, did I do them right? Mm. Just that itself, because there's a difference between why when they do all these studies and they say, oh, so-and-so has this diet where they eat very healthy and they may say I only eat vegetables and I don't eat any meat and animal protein and they have IBS and then you got this other person who eats like McDonald's every single day and doesn't even eat one piece of vegetable the difference though is is that McDonald's guy is the happiest person in the world yes, yes. and he just shows up every moment that is huge. So that's not why it's black and white. And you say, well, I followed the scripted way of doing every single thing. And so-and-so smokes like a chimney and always eats at McDonald's and he doesn't have any issues. Yes, there's a difference. Did you look at both of you? That guy probably thinks that every day is the best day of his life. So that is still the one thing that, you know, we have the gift that we can give that one thing to ourselves and nobody else can take away is our attitude. So we decide that that's when people like me and so many others can drive, you know, we are the guides to help each person be there also guides. Absolutely. Uh, I ended up writing uh, an ebook called the seven step health pyramid, which is, which was my insight into how I got my health back. Um, and guess what the base of the pyramid is? Calm. <laughs> and what I say is that if you don't get to calm, it doesn't matter how much kale you're having or what detox pills you're taking, it doesn't matter. Your body is in a stressed out fighting mode. It is not in a healing mode. And so I always say this, if you've decided that you want to get healthy, because that's the first decision, have you decided you're getting your health back? Once you've decided, then the first step really is you've got to get to calm. And there's so many different ways of doing it. You've given a very simple way, which is just be grateful that you're alive and just show up, you know, sit and enjoy your meal. Uh, that's why we used to pray before we ate. And this was across all religions. You would sit down, you would give a little prayer of gratitude, thank you for, for this food. And it was because you were creating the right environment in your body to receive the nourishment that was about to come. What do we do now? We are stuffing our faces while driving through traffic <laughs> and yelling at our kid or our spouse for something that hasn't happened. Um, it's literally the opposite. How can the body nourish? Because the body is very busy trying to deal with the stress that you've created in it. So that, that sounds wonderful. Let's talk about a little bit um, arthritis. You mentioned at the very beginning that arthritis, autoimmune, those are the other things you focused on. So what is the connection between gut and arthritis? And is arthritis reversible? And what beyond the getting to calm, what are the other things that you've seen that actually deliver results? Well, think about how do all these things happen, right? So how do people say there's a connection between the gut and heart disease, arthritis? It's relatively pretty simple. I mean, it's like 
the way that things enter into your body is you enter it through your mouth, which is drinking and breathing and eating, through your nose somewhat, and I mean, that's, that's it. And so you say, well, there's these like avenues for things to come in, but there are like four channels for it to come out. And the biggest one is pooping it, there's urine, there's sweating it, and there's exhaling. And so the biggest one that we, the biggest one is your mouth. So when the stuff going in basically is breaking the system down, what's gonna happen? It's gonna leak out. And when it leaks out, where's it gonna go? Because it, you, couldn't, you weren't getting it out by your stools or your urine or exhaling it uh, or really sweating it out. I mean, those exhaling and sweating are lesser of excretion than the other two. And so when the system is breaking down, so the gut is breaking down, that gunk is going to go and it's gonna deposit into your joints, for example. And it's gonna start eating away those joints. And so when you say inflammatory joints, you know, so you take a leave and you transiently feel better and, and said, um, and people say, oh, it's just because you wore it out. I don't think so. Uh, because why is it that if you go to some other parts of the world, like in Okinawa, Japan, the, the average age there is 90s. Those people are very active. They've been active their entire lives. They walk tons and tons of miles every day. For most people in their lives, they just move. So yes, movement is really important. We weren't meant to have legs so we could sit on a chair all day. Um, we were meant to move. We were meant to keep it pretty simple. So it's a mix of, if you break the system down, which is really the gut is just not getting the gunk out. And so it, it basically gets all these holes, which leaks things out. It's gonna go into the joint. And they're not really moving. Um, and number three, people, you know, if you really watch the way they exhale, they're almost like they're hyperventilating, like they're so rushed to get going to wherever they want to go that they actually do not fully expand their lung bases when they exhale. So they do not get the used air, which is the carbon dioxide, out of the lungs. Yeah. Therefore, oxygen will not go into your cells. Yeah. It has to release that carbon dioxide. So it's the art of, you know, how this flows. So yes, will it be reversed? Yes, I mean, you can see people in a split second where they, they come in and they have excruciating pain. Pain is basically, you're not getting oxygen flow. That's why pain happens. So when all of a sudden there's blood flowing and there's oxygen getting delivered and you stop freaking out for that one second, you actually feel a little bit better. So there's a reinforcement that, wow, I felt better. And it wasn't just because I took this pain pill. Yeah. And so then you feel confident to say, well, I could kind of move and it'll be okay. Yeah. So it's not about if you have arthritis and you should just, you know, people say do tons of physical therapy. Yes, that's great. But if you're in excruciating pain, honestly, there's no way that that's going to be effective. So we've got to know that, yes, we're going to adjust it to that specific person. But in any point that where a person is, Anything is reversible. Anything can get better. You got to believe in it. Yeah. Um, and we see it. Why? We see it. You go to so many other parts of the world. Yeah. They don't even have half these things. They don't. They don't. So leaky gut's a big part of the problem, as you've described. What are the foods that contribute to leaky gut? We'll, we'll go through all the factors of leaky gut, but let's start with foods. What are the foods, uh, Dr. Pyle, that if I'm on a mission to heal my gut, what are the foods I need to really get out of my system now? I would say start with the foods that basically take three to seven days minimum um, to get out of your entire digestive tract. Okay. Those yes. are basically the foods that require the most water for production in agriculture um, because they are naturally very dehydrating items. So if you got to keep watering them to produce them, then your body basically was going to interpret them as dehydrating and you're not going to get nutrients out of them. You're not going to get your protein out of them. They're going to create a very acidic reaction. So 
those fall into any form of animal protein because you know the bigger an item is animals are big you know from a chicken to the byproducts of a chicken to a cow or other animal products they need a lot of water so you can produce their products but our body is not meant to have things that take us like days and days to pass through so we really don't actually get that much nourishment from them and they actually create a very acidic reaction and especially in the lifestyle that people live in today's world so i think that's the starting point number two is really look at agriculture and see just what foods require a lot of water so number two is your GMO crops, like corn, soy, wheat, they require tons and tons of water for production. So when you consume them, it doesn't matter if they're organic or not, they are gonna take a long time to break down and they're not gonna help people feel light and nourish very quickly. Um, the other thing you wanna know is that most of these crops are used in your animal products. So even if you're, um, saying I'm gluten free. Well, if you have like poultry and eggs, at some point you're gonna be getting, you're, you're getting your, your GMO crops. I think the third thing is think about nuts. Most gardeners would never grow nuts because they require a lot of water to have nut trees. So again, it's really simple. I want you to get back to the basics and really understand how are things grown. If you recognize if you have a garden or if you've ever seen a garden, you, realize, you see that certain foods are really grown with a limited amount of water. Those foods, we can eat them and they nourish us. They go through our colon possibly within a day. The foods that most gardeners will not invest in are the foods that take too many resources. If they take too many resources like water, then they are gonna be sprayed heavily. They're gonna be exposed to a lot more contaminated water, which is gonna have gasoline additives and other industrial toxins in it. Your system, when you eat those foods, they've gotta to try to figure out how to clean out that gunk. And it doesn't matter what the marketing label is. Yeah. It is gonna take more energy and you may not have the energy. So you gotta keep it simple. You gotta think about whatever grows in a garden above ground, it, will pass through you really fast. If it grows on the trees, those are flowers. So respect the flowers. Don't just gobble up all the flowers and not have any left for your neighbor. Those are your nuts and your fruits. So I'm not saying don't eat them, but you gotta know how long it took to make them. And if you're like, well, there's just so many of them. You gotta realize that we took a lot of shortcuts so you have the illusion that there's plenty of them out there, but there's not, right? Um, you gotta connect to how much water is required. That's my simplest way is instead of people giving them a black and white you know, cookbook list of do this and do that, I need people to just go outside and look at the gardens and recognize that there is a delusion of, oh, well, I, all these foods are so plentiful and there's so much protein and there's so much fat. That's not the way the body works. It really is, there's a reason why things were grown a certain way. Um, there's a reason why things that we used to not have so much are now grown in excess abundance. And why are they grown so fast? We're manipulating the systems. And when we do that, our body did not change. So they do not create the right biochemical reaction to make it safe for us. Where do you come out on gluten, corn, soy? So you've talked about meat products and dairy, but where do you come out on those? So again, this is not true in all over the world, right? So you have to look at um, definitely the United States um, for sure, because when you modify the seeds of a food, our microbiome can no longer recognize them. And we did that because we thought when it came out, wow, we're gonna solve hunger. Well, we never solved hunger um, because we don't get nourished from, from those foods. And when we modify the actual seed, we also at the same time said, oh, I can spray these really heavily and these crops will not die. So what happens then all of a sudden is the seed is modified across the board. Um, and it's not just the United States because we are also the largest seed producer for most of the world. 
and we do control those crop prices. And so what's happening is, is that those seeds are not recognized by the microbiome. They are heavily sprayed by you know, pesticides like Roundup, but there are many others. And our body doesn't consider them safe. So this is a lot less of a concern if you are in certain parts of the world where there's not as much um, time spent in the transportation of the food to the consumer. There's not as many middlemen. Whereas in the United States, for example, we have a lot of middlemen from when a food is produced to when you get it to your stores. And that means that the food, you didn't want it to go bad, right? So you sprayed it very heavily to do certain things to change it. So wheat, corn, soy are one of the main crops that do require a lot of water for production. So for them not to mold, we do have to modify them. Um, but that, again, takes is at the detriment of losing any value. And you also have to realize that before the mid 90s, when GMOs did not, did not really exist, we, we did not have that many um, acres of corn, soy, and wheat grown. Number two, that you have to know that soy um, predominantly was a very small commodity. It was primarily produced in mass consumption for the automobile industry, not for human consumption. And it is a bit different. The seeds are different in the Asian cultures or the Eastern cultures that they've had soy for you know many hundreds of years. The seeds are different back then. They use them very differently than they do in today's world. What are the foods that are ideal for building gut health and for reversing leaky gut? So you've talked about what not to incorporate into your diet. What's a good healthy diet? What are the foods that our body thrives? What that our gut loves? They like green vegetables. <laughs> I what mean, about nightshades. What is the, the controversy around nightshades? Are those good or bad? So again, that if you think about it, I didn't know what that word meant um, 15 years ago. You know, we didn't learn that in medical school and residency and afterwards. So it's like, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, and Nightshades, again, many people put lots of foods into the in nightshades. Um, you know, I, again, say have whatever's grown above ground. So when you, you create a garden, you grow, the grass grows really fast. Any of that stuff works. Again, there's an art of how to eat it. So I do suggest dress it with some sort of an oil so you can actually use the fat to absorb the nutrients. With nightshades, um, some of the key ones are the things that are grown underground um, because whatever grows underground, it depends on what grows above ground to actually grow and it is actually a medicine. So unless you're, I mean, what's happening is, is that because it takes longer to grow those items underground, um, they are also getting exposed to much more contaminated ground water. And they are used as medicines in many cultures. Mm -hmm. So they were used as medicines because they help support the immune system. But it doesn't mean you have medicine every single every day, day whenever you want it. Yeah. And like so what happens? Yeah. So they actually overstimulate the nervous system of the gut and they make it shut down. So the key ones are garlic, um, onions, uh, sweet potatoes, potatoes, um, ginger to a lesser degree. Uh, beets and carrots. Again, part of it is that reason. The other reason is the seeds have changed in the United States. So we've actually made the seeds sweeter. We've yeah. caused some of the value of the nourishment of an onion, potatoes, sweet potatoes, carrots. We've changed it. So it's not the same as even 300 years ago. Then the other nightshade is tomatoes. Same thing. We really modify the tomato. So you use a tomato as a fruit. You treat it like a fruit. Um, you do not have it as much as you want whenever you might. Tomatoes are best cooked than they are raw. They are a luxury item. Um, those are really what I put in my nightshade category. Okay. Um, I don't put everything like kale and other items. Um, I think also 
again, all the greens are not the same. So some people, honestly, they do much better um, when they have a very fragile gut to have their greens sauteed than raw because, you know, it takes more energy to, you got to chew a lot more raw food. But if your system is weak, you don't even produce enough digestive enzymes to actually tolerate a bunch of raw, like salad. Yeah. So you almost have to saute your salad to actually get the value out of it because you let the cooking process do some of the work for you, but then you got to take your time and eat it. So in the greens, there is, of course, the whole cruciferous family, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, which are wonderful because they go in and they can take toxins out, but not everyone can digest them. And then, of course, you've got the beans, uh, peas, asparagus, and again, I speak from experience. I remember when, when I was going through my gut issues, I felt like everything made me react. Yeah. And so they would say, well, go eat more broccoli. And I was like, I can't take broccoli. Yes. Go eat peas. I can't do peas. Eat kale. Nope, not working. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of truth to that. So all these things that you mentioned, the ones that you, the way, I, the way I'll explain it is, if you were to cook it, the ones that cook the fastest have those. The ones that take longer with oil, you know, they're hardier. Those are luxury items, right? So I'm not saying don't do it, but for some people, eating a bunch of asparagus and broccoli and Brussels sprouts will make them bloated. Yeah. It takes a lot of energy to break those foods down. So, you know, the simplest thing is if it takes longer to break it down, it's a luxury item. And maybe you have it change the form. So maybe the cauliflower is more like mushy and it's better to use a cauliflower than the potato. So the form is important that it's not the same. Um, kale, right? Kale is, takes longer to cook than say um, Swiss chard, right? So there's, you've got to actually see how it works instead of just looking at the name and eating it. Um, the only other exception in this whole is spinach. So I do not advocate a lot of spinach, um, partly because spinach has really changed. It's very popular in the United States. So what we've done is we mass produce it and we'll spray it with nitric oxide. So all of a sudden, the actual balance between carbohydrates, protein, and nutrients has changed in spinach, for example. So it has more carbohydrates than nutrients. And two, it then has more oxalates. So you can't even absorb the iron effectively. It's not saying don't do it, but what's happened is people will say, oh, I have lots of spinach smoothies. Every single day, exactly. Yeah. And the reality is, is that there, it is confusing because nobody is aware of how things are grown anymore. Exactly. They, they're completely disconnected yeah. from not just that, but then they're, if you're disconnected from that, you people are, we're all, including myself, have been disconnected by even putting anything together. Yep. And then we're disconnected by eating it. Yep. So again, you got to start with what's simple. You can't change it all. Um, but I do want people to start opening their eyes, listening, and actually where, how is things put together? Because if you just read labels, and you believe that they're there to sell you the item. They're not there to help you heal. What about khichdi, which Ayurveda has used traditionally for thousands of years as almost a cleanse? You know, you do khichdi as a way to just give your gut a rest, but it's grains and it's high carb. And so now there's all this controversy. Oh, khichdi is a terrible thing. Where do you come out on something like a khichdi? I mean, khichdi is... I love kitchari, but kitchari is basically just a mix of beans and grains. Mm -hmm. So you also have to know what is that mix. So for instance, um, the way I look at it is the items that are the tiniest, when you see them dry, they have the most value because something so small can give so much love. The something that is big takes a lot more resources to grow it. So it takes more energy to break it down. So when you look at beans, look at the actual size of the beans, okay. not from a can, but the smaller the size is, the less resources it took from the earth. So for example, a um, 
a black lentil or a mung, um, like red lentil is much smaller than a chickpea, mm -hmm. right? Um, or a kidney bean. Too. So when you start with beans, you pick the tiniest one. Got it. And just soak it overnight um, or in hot water and then cook it. It'll cook really fast. If it takes longer to cook, well, then remember it's gonna take, it's gonna cook longer in your belly. On grains, again, pick the tiniest grains. So for instance, millet, amaranth, quinoa are much smaller than a rice kernel, um, a wheat or corn kernel. So the, the smaller the kernel size, that's great. So you gotta try one at a time before you mix them all up. Um, and with kichuri, kichuri is a mix of um, beans and grains. So what I usually suggest is I'll say start with like only the quinoa or only the lentil. Don't just mix them all three and then say this is going to be fine. So and with my the kichuri I define is it's not always rice based. It's not always like um, this one specific dal base. You've got to start small. Because um, it's kind of like babies, right? Yeah. Babies have so much nourish knowledge, and they teach us so much. And that little person has so much depth. Well, food is a our is is what nourishes us. So we have to connect with um, not just well. This is just the way it's done. You got to get back to people knew all these things. So that's why they would adjust a kichuri, um, and they would give kichuri instead of roti when people yes. were sick because yes. they said this is easier to digest it's liquidy but right. why would i give this person bread when they don't feel good exactly exactly what about supplements so um of course we live in a very commercial world where everybody makes money off of everyone's health issues and so there's again a lot of misinformation around supplements what works what doesn't work god knows i spent thousands of dollars on trying everything from L-glutamine to zinc carnosine to, I mean, you name it, I did it. I bought the leaky gut supplements and um, some of that stuff gets expensive. What have you found, as, as you mentioned, you know, it takes the gut, well, everything kind of regenerates in our body, but the gut lining regenerates, as I've heard, in three days. Is that correct? No, it takes longer than that. It takes longer than that, okay. Yeah. It takes 90 days. Okay. Um, but that is if you are fueling it properly. The okay. first thing is you got to clean it out. You have to do no harm. Yes. So if you can do no harm, and harm yes. is in many aspects, Yes. Um, then you will start to eventually get to repair. Because if there's constant harm, how are you going to repair that one cell wall colon? It's not going to happen. Right? It's going to keep getting broken down. Exactly. So it really takes 90 days to like transform. And then again, depending on the level of severity of a person's health, right. it will, you gauge accordingly, but it will keep getting better. And yes, you can see shifts even within three days. And what about the supplements? What uh, supplements do you recommend? What are your favorites that you've seen actually work? So, I mean, supplements I, are important part um, of the overall care because I think we really can't fix it all by just saying okay just change your whole life um, so I try to keep it really simple um, my favorite is integrative therapeutics physicians elemental powder because it has activated um, multi all the all the vitamins that need to be activated are activated it has all of your amino acids, so to make your proteins, your hormones, and um, antioxidants. It's also very clean, um, no non-GMO, and no animal protein. So I use that as a way to nourish the cells, to detox, and to support um, overall functioning. I also like it because I get people to drink water, like this, you know, really help support the system, so they're not also eating as much you got to let the gut rest i mean humans were meant to not keep feeding it we were meant to fast a lot more right so that's one of my favorites i also like um, using turmeric and glutamine um, turmeric is a very potent 
anti-inflammatory, antiseptic. It's great for the gut. Mm -hmm. So I use just your regular turmeric spice, but I also use it in you know supplement form. Um, glutamine is basically helps form glutathione, which is your most important intracellular antioxidant. So the my favorite combination of it is Integrative Therapeutics Glutamine Forte. Again, it's a powder form, so I'm a bigger fan of powders and liquids because it helps deliver things more effectively to the cells. If you've already kind of have a broken down gut and you take a bunch of pills, how is your stomach gonna break down a bunch of pills and how is it actually gonna go in the cells? It's too, it's too fragile. So I do limit the number of pills that people take. I am, I'm, very uh, want the pills or whatever the products are i really do want them to be plant-based um gmo free because there's less um exposures to pesticides and toxins the packaging is also important because you know if the packaging um is also lined with a lot of gunk then it's an issue uh, so those are two of my favorites again there are a slew of others that i use to help with the constant stress response a lot of these people have where they're over fine cortisol or they just burned out their adrenal glands. So it may be things that they need to help them in the day so they can actually not tell their body they're freaking out. And also um, for those who are you know, t consuming a lot of caffeine, um, gotta find ways to get them off the caffeine because caffeine is a water, it's a diuretic, so it makes you lose all your water-soluble vitamins, which then are your critical antioxidants. And then also for the people who are not doing adequate repair work at night or not sleeping well, then I have a couple things um, that I recommend uh, to help them actually let their body do some repair work. Um, they may be mixed with like valerian or ashwagandha or melatonin. Um, but it's the, it's really finding what's right for those individuals. It's not like one size fits all and here's what everybody gets. But the two I did mention, the Physician's Elemental Powder and the Glutamine Forte, those are definitely my favorites. Um, they work um, effectively. The art is though how to dose it. So I do not dose it the way the packaging recommends because that can be too much. So I always start less and then can go up. The third thing is I do use magnesium citrate powder um, from bulksupplements.com because almost all these individuals have extreme intracellular magnesium deficiency. And magnesium is critical to manage your electrical heart rhythm, to actually go to the bathroom, to keep your blood sugar under control so your system is not saying keep producing a lot of cortisol. So I also then teach people how to use it precisely so it works, it doesn't just cause them diarrhea, um, and it continues to really help with cell regeneration. So again, supplements are helpful. Um, it's the art of how to use them that is personalized to each person. Absolutely, and I think magnesium is clearly one of those that we are all very deficient in and it's such a critical element for us to have so thank you for mentioning that all right so as we wrap because we could talk forever um but as we wrap this particular segment of our interview what is the one recommendation that you have that you haven't already shared with someone who's dealing with gut issues You just have to, you have to believe. Just believe that at any moment, things are gonna turn around and it starts with have faith, have hope. If you give that up, then, then I'm not sure what we can do, but if you fundamentally just have that inkling of hope and you put that intention out there, things are gonna get better. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Pyle. Thank you for sharing all of your great insights. And of course, for the rest of you, in the show notes, we're gonna have a link to Dr. Pyle Bhandari's uh, integrative practice, which is out of San Francisco. And um, you stay smiling, you keep hope, 
you believe that you can reverse it because of course you can. I did it. I know you can too. And I'm going to see you on another healthier podcast. If you enjoyed this or you know someone who's got gut issues, please share the love. I'll see you soon.